So it's a historical fantasy in a real place, but mm-hmm. the world is still, I, I still wanted the world to feel like a character. So mm-hmm. in that case, it wasn't me creating from scratch. Right. It was me rebuilding this real place and making it feel real to the reader. So mm-hmm. they feel like they're walking down those streets and they understand what this city is and that mm-hmm. the the time period and the, and the location affects the characters in certain ways. So you can absolutely do it with real places. It doesn't have mm-hmm. to be, you know, Middle Earth or something like that. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Men podcast where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Leslie Penelope. Yes, we do. I love yeah. her. She is so great. And we were just saying before we got on to do the um, intro, because yeah, sure. we we've already done the the uh, interview that she's just such a great teacher. Like mm-hmm. she just is able to put things in a way that is easily digestible, I think. And mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. We, we talked to her about world building and just lots of different things related to writing, um, FOMO, mm-hmm. um, making maps for books, mm-hmm. all kinds of yeah. things. Having so a direct, great community. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so so direct, direct, with, yeah. with pay hip, uh, mm-hmm. doing sign books that way, how she gets everything done. She has two podcasts as well. So Crazy. all that information is in the show notes. If you yeah. want to go check out our other podcasts. So that's yeah. coming up soon. Yeah. Um, Let's see. We don't have any new supporters this week, but thank you to everyone who continues to support the podcast. Yes. Um, each week we, or each month, we really appreciate it. And um, if you're interested in uh, supporting the podcast, you can go to wish I'd known for writers.com slash support. What's going on with you? Well, I've been writing every day and uh, yeah, that's pretty much, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Um, it kind of takes over your life, doesn't it? It does. And I'm not, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's not like I'm getting tons of words. I'm, I'm getting good word count, but it takes, it's taking longer than it normally would. Uh, but that's to be expected. Doesn't and, it always though? Well, that's true. I always feel like it takes longer than yeah. it, it used to yeah. or it should. Yeah. And my brain is tired. I noticed that my brain is very tired when I'm done, but it's because, you know, that's, that muscle hasn't been used very much. Mm-hmm. So that's, Good. I feel good about that. Um, yeah, I think that's probably all okay. that I got going on. Yeah, not yeah. a whole lot other than that. How yeah. about you? Writing as well, getting back yeah. into good. it. And it's mm-hmm. going well, getting a lot. I mean, you know, like. Are you still doing it, your dictating and then? Um, yeah, I'm doing some dictation and then I clean that up. And if I'm having issues with it or it doesn't feel right. Mm-hmm. I'll maybe use AI to help me rephrase something or mm-hmm. give me a different idea. So, but yeah, I am, I'm still using dictation. It's still like a big hot mess when it's done and I have mm-hmm. to go in and clean it up. So I don't know that it really saves me a ton of time, but mm-hmm. it, it gives me stuff to work with and I'd rather edit than draft. From yeah. Scratch. You, you, you really so, do. Yeah. yeah so that. that's why I do that. So, but that's going good. And that's, you know, kind of taken over. I put other things on hold. But I am thinking about my next release and I sent an email off today to get some character sketches mm-hmm. and I'm going to get a map. Um, so I have just some things, you know, like mm-hmm. working in the background. That's, great. Um, that's not my priority right now. And then I know like hovering over on the edge of the my field of vision are taxes. So I'm yeah, well, yeah, I know. scanning yeah. documents for taxes. I know. I know. I've got a stack over here of things. Um but I am actually redoing the bride's covers too. Oh, Just yeah. Just kind of in the process of that. Yeah. So, so how's that going? Uh, well, so far, so good. I'm working with uh, someone right now. Uh, Rachel Robinson uh, is helping me kind of get a vision. And because I'm not good, you know, I don't speak cover language. I don't, 
it's very it's it's, it's so a special hard it's, dialect and it? as you will find in this episode i say things are overwhelming a lot well that is overwhelming to me i just feel like i don't have a vision or if i have a vision i don't know how to explain it mm-hmm. so it's nice to be able to have somebody help me with that and yeah that's that's about it just All right. yeah plugging along watching true detective season four and it Ooh. scared the poo out of me more than once so <laughs> so it's it's good huh yeah I'm not sure like I don't know I want to keep at it because I love Jodie Foster and I want to support but whew, it's scary <laughs> so don't watch it at night no, when you're home alone, it, basically. Yeah, alone, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. Other than that, just yeah. plugging away. Okay, so. well, I don't have anything um, entertainment-wise to recommend. I'm watching a couple of K-dramas, and if they turn out good, I'll let y'all know. Okay. Um, finished a street. I think I mentioned that mm-hmm. last time. It was very mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. still my top rec. So. Yeah, you do love that. Yeah, I just like the... I like that the characters have an arc and they mm-hmm. let them continue. Well, I don't feel right. like they're retreading right. stories and storylines, which is right. nice. Yeah, that's so. good. But we all should, right. Leslie, because she's uh, super smart. Yes. All right. So here is Leslie. Yep. Well, today we are really excited to talk with Leslie Penelope. Hi, Leslie. How are you? I'm doing really great. How are y'all? Thanks for having me. We are great. And I'm so excited you're here. Um, we met in May. Yes. Or, no, June at June. InkersCon. And, mm-hmm. you know, Leslie's one of those people that I just assume she's one of the smartest people in the room when, oh, uh, when we're is. talking. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when we're together, she and as Claire Taylor, you know, I have like a list of people. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I w- I'm excited to get you on. Oh, the thank podcast. you. Yeah, this will be fun, I think, to go through this. So let me read your bio and we'll get started. Leslie Penelope has been writing since she could hold a pen and loves getting lost in the words in her head. She is an award-winning author of fantasy and paranormal romance. Equally left and right-brained, she studied filmmaking and computer science in college and sometimes dreams in HTML. Which <laughs> is <Just> great. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, our first question is usually, how'd you get into writing? But your bio pretty much uh, answers that. So when did you start writing professionally and how did that happen? Yeah, it took a while because I did. I wrote, you know, I was in literary magazines and college and I mean, high school, college, but I was writing for myself. And then I started taking writing workshops after I first got married and we moved away to a new place. And that was kind of the beginning of it. But it was really after uh, one of these writing workshops that I went for a week to study writing. Mm -hmm. came back and I was really inspired and I started writing what became Song of Blood and Stone, which is my first book. Mm -hmm. And it was just being around writers and in those kind of educational environments. Like I didn't think I was going to get an MFA and I didn't get an MFA, but I did do, you know, weekend workshops and week long Mm -hmm. workshops here and there and met people and, and started to believe that I could actually write a whole novel as opposed to just like short stories or poems. Mm-hmm. And then I started researching self-publishing. So I had this book and I determined from the beginning I was going to self-publish my first book. And I did it in 2015. In January 2015 is when my very first novel came out. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. When I would think about writing, because, you know, I didn't start writing until I was 50. So when I, any time before that, when I would think about writing a book, it was that whole, a whole book, like right. writing a that. whole book. How do you do imagine. that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, I understand that feeling. And it's still yeah. hard. Like every time I do it, it's still yeah, like, me too. Oh, wait, yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> yeah. I think that's kind of why we have writer's block sometimes. Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh, it's such a humongous project. Do I even want to start this thing? Because right. it's a long it's road. Overwhelming. Yeah. 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 Well, what's your definition of success? So I think about that a lot and Mm -hmm. I've actually been doing, you know, I have a podcast and talking Mm -hmm. about that a little bit and starting to talk to other authors about it. For me right now, it's still being someone's favorite author is my Mm -hmm. definition of success. And I have Mm -hmm. heard from people. And so like, what happens when you get that? Well, it's like, you just want more. (laughs) So that's still it. It still makes my heart just burst if someone tells me that I'm one of their favorite authors. That's amazing. I love love that. that. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, me too. And and I'm sure you have heard that many times because your books are so popular. Um, 
But tell us about your podcast, because you mentioned your podcast, and then I know you're doing a podcast with Inez as well. Yeah, I'm one of those people who has two podcasts. It's like, why? <laughs> you're a crazy person, right? <laughs> no, exactly. I've had my, my, my first podcast is called My Imaginary Friends, mm-hmm. and it's been a solo show for the past um, four years, mm-hmm. almost five years. Mm-hmm. And it's basically just a journal of my life. I'm a hybrid author now, so mm-hmm. I still self-publish. I have traditionally published books as well. And it's just sort of like behind the scenes, ups and downs, sharing the journey with people. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I could do that by myself really easily. And I really enjoy doing it. So they're kind of Mm -hmm. short shows. But uh, at the end of last year, the end of 2023, me and one of my best friends in the world, Inez Johnson, we were also college roommates at Howard University. So we've known each other for many, many years. We started a new podcast and it's called Ink and Magic. And it's Mm -hmm. about fantasy and paranormal romance. So Mm -hmm. we are starting out rereading Nalini Singh's Psy Changeling series, Mm -hmm. which was one of the series that got me into paranormal romance and romance reading in general. I I didn't grow up reading romance novels. Uh, I was an adult, yeah, when I got into them. And I got in through paranormal. Mm -hmm. So we're going through, we're rereading, we're talking about those books, and we're also talking about craft she and I both love craft. Um, Inez Johnson is like a craft genius. I'm sure you guys know this. Mm-hmm. Uh, the genius about many things in writing. <laughs> and so, yeah, we come at it from very different places. But since we've known each other, since we were teenagers, mm-hmm. we have this rapport and we we can disagree in a friendly way and knowing we're not going to hurt each other's feelings and things like right. that. Right. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, they're great. Uh, the one you do with Inez is so fun. It's such a great podcast. Oh, thanks. I think I it's really interesting. One. I'm going to have to yeah. check that one out. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so interesting to do a podcast, like a deep dive in into a book or a series, because you can really get into the mechanics of it. Mm-hmm. Um, are y'all doing multiple episodes over one book or just you read the book and you have one episode? Yeah, so we, we're reading the book, one episode per book, and then and we're doing basically a book every other week. So in between the wow. book episodes, we'll, we're doing craft and just different craft topics. Uh-huh. We're also having some guests in too. And I Mm -hmm. think that at a certain point, we might pause and kind of look at certain aspects of that series and do deeper dives into, you know, Mm -hmm. once we've gotten through the first, because that series is kind of split into two seasons, uh, Mm -hmm. Nalini Singh calls it. So we've got ideas for how to go even deeper into it. But yeah, Mm -hmm. right now it's kind of just our our thoughts and impressions and whether we remember it or not from the original time we read it, uh, how, you know, how much we love these books. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds fantastic. And yeah. lots of material there. Probably an yes. endless amount of material. Yeah. So much. <laughs> yeah. I always well, say that Twilight was my gateway drug into uh, romance mm-hmm. because yeah. it wasn't a real romance, but it was kind of a romance. And then it was just enough to get me hooked. And then, yeah. Mm-hmm. Twilight led me into, then I started reading Cressley Cole and Nalini mm-hmm. Singh yep. and adults, so like the YA. And I was still reading YA a lot at that time too, mm-hmm. but definitely Twilight is the gateway for so many people, mm-hmm. so many writers, mm-hmm. so many readers. Yeah. 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 Well, since we're talking about writing a craft, what is something that you wish you'd known about writing a craft? Oh, there's so many things. Like, <laughs> I learned so much all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh the biggest leap for me from wanting to write novels to actually finishing a novel mm-hmm. was teaching myself about plot. You know, mm-hmm. like even though if you're in writing workshops, whether you're in a college environment or, you know, like a writing course that you take online, it's hard to teach plot. And a lot of times traditional like MFA programs don't really bother with that. <laughs> you know, they're they're into <laughs> other things. I don't know what they're teaching. But yeah, teaching, learning to actually plot and and story structure and mm-hmm. that kind of thing is, it can be difficult to wrap your head around, especially when you've been writing short for so long. Mm-hmm. So I really wish I'd had a, earlier on, I'd had a better grasp of plot, but I did. I, I bought a bunch of books and I, I set myself the task to learn how to plot a novel as mm-hmm. I was writing that first one. And that was one of the most important things that I did um, in, in terms of craft early on. Mm-hmm. That's Do you great. have any books that uh, you would recommend if someone's mm-hmm. interested in that, that like stand out to you that you go back to again and again, or maybe Definitely. one that helped you? Yeah. I mean, Save the Cat uh, by Blake Snyder and then Save the mm-hmm. Cat writes a novel because Save mm-hmm. the Cat is like a screenwriting book. Mm-hmm. Both yeah. of those go hand in hand and that's extremely foundational. Um, Goal, Motivation and Conflict by Deborah Dixon was another mm-hmm. one was just like base. Like that was one of the early ones that I read that 
it broke open for me the importance of those three concepts. Mm-hmm. And another one that I go back to again and again is Write Your Novel from the Middle by James mm-hmm. Scott Bell. It's really thin. And literally every book I write, I pull it out multiple times a week and just be like, okay, what, what is my midpoint? What is my mirror moment? Mm-hmm. He, he ha- It's so succinct, but I also just need to refresh myself all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, those are some of the ones I always recommend to people. And they were so important to me. Yeah, yeah. that's a great list. Yeah, I I recently uh, listened to uh, and then ordered it, but uh, Save the Cat writes a novel. I'd read Save the Cat, but I just recently, that is such a, I mean, like I was listening to it going, oh yeah, oh, I see now what you're, because I'm not really a plotter, but Mm -hmm. it made me understand things better than I had before. And so I really did enjoy that book a lot. I'm it breaks gonna... it down in a really easy to understand way for yeah. novelists. Yeah. Yeah. I'm writing down the James Scott Bell book because I've heard it a million times, but um, I've never read it. And so I'm going to check it out. It's great. Yeah. Well, what do you wish you'd known about marketing when you started? Yeah, I don't think I knew anything about marketing. <laughs> <laughs> I did the year that I was writing Song of Blood and Stone um, and editing it, actually, mm-hmm. because it took a long time to edit. It went through several versions before that first self-published version. I was also researching all kinds of self-publishing topics. I was listening to podcasts and reading blogs, and I was in Yahoo groups. It was before <laughs> Facebook groups were a big thing. I don't think Facebook groups existed. It was all Yahoo groups or like Google yeah. groups or something. Yeah. Um, and so I was learning about marketing. And I had some experience with online marketing in terms of I'm a website developer Mm -hmm. and I had uh, co-created this independent literary magazine that I ran for six years. And so we had to do some kind of marketing, Mm -hmm. but it's just so hard. It's so hard when you're Mm -hmm. a creative person. And even though I was an entrepreneur and a business owner. um, And so one of the the, the things that I still have to teach myself over and over is that marketing is not really about selling yourself. Marketing mm-hmm. is about convincing the person, you know, their customer, why they will benefit from whatever the thing is you want them to buy. Mm-hmm. So why is that just how great your book is? It's how will this book, you know, give you hours mm-hmm. of entertainment or mm-hmm. scratch that itch, mm-hmm. you know, make it about the reader. Mm-hmm. And if you can focus your marketing efforts on like what readers like and what how the reader is going to relate to this thing that you wrote, that is the most important thing. And that really takes the pressure off, right? Because I think a lot of us are very self-conscious. We don't want to be like, oh, talking about ourselves all the time. But Mm -hmm. if you think of it as offering somebody something that they're going to enjoy and want to read or listen to again and again, you know, get lost in this story world, right? Right. Mm -hmm. If you think of it as like, I'm giving you this gift of this thing that you're going to love. Like if you find the person who loves it, Mm -hmm. when I find a book that I love, it's like, I'm so happy that I have it. So mm-hmm. it, if you take it away from, I have to sell, I have to sell, I I feel right. so dirty and salesy, mm-hmm. you know, but like, mm-hmm. how can you find the person who's like, really just wants this thing that you've written and is going to be so happy once they've read it? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a great perspective. I'm curious. So were you and Ines writing at the same time? I mean, writing and publishing at the same time? Um, and who did it first? So we, like I said, we were college roommates and Mm -hmm. then, you know, she, we both lived our lives and we were in separate states and we reconnected in 2011 Mm -hmm. at actually one of these week long writing workshops that we were both in. And so after that, we started meeting, um, we we created a group and we would meet and we actually did our first, we won our first NaNoWriMo together, I think, because we were meeting in a group online. I think she might have published first. I published in 2015. I think she was in late 2014. It oh, was okay. really close together, though, okay. uh, those first books mm-hmm. that we had. And so I have been on this journey together. Yeah, yeah we had really parallel really cool. paths because we were beta reading for each other years before that and mm-hmm. sharing books and getting at each other hooked on different book series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love those book buddies. Those are the yeah. best. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career? And looking back, did it turn out to be right or wrong? So I think I made assumptions about how to publish because mm-hmm. I'd heard all these horror stories about traditional publishing. And you know, this is back in 2013, 2014, mm-hmm. when I was deciding, when I was still writing the book, editing the book, my first book. And I just assumed that traditional publishing wouldn't want the book that I was writing. It wouldn't want, you know, a fantasy novel with Black people in it, with magic. And 
I was convinced that I was going to have to, if I went that route, they would, you know, ask me to change things. We were still in the era of whitewashing covers and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I was just a DIY person. I had done all these other DIY projects from indie filmmaking to an independent magazine. And so I went that route and I don't regret it. But that first series, I did end up eventually selling it to a traditional publisher who came to me. And so that was just a surprising thing. I mean, who knows what what would have happened if I had gone on submission. I mean, I, I learned so many valuable things from self-publishing mm-hmm. and things that I, I take into my traditionally published books and experiences in trad. I, I use in my indie books as well, even to this day. So I don't have regrets, but I, I do wish that I had been maybe more open-minded or just thought about things in a different way because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you never know what could happen. Right. Right. Yeah. Sounds like you have got the best of both worlds though now. Do you mm-hmm. feel that way? Like it all worked out? I think it worked out well because I still love indie publishing. I love having all the control mm-hmm. and, you know, all of this, all the great stuff that we have. And then working with traditional publishers, while it can be very frustrating not to have the control and not to be able to make all of those decisions, sometimes mm-hmm. it's uh, relaxing to just give it to someone else and say, hey, you do these things and I will mm-hmm. do these things over here for, for these other books. Yeah. So I do like, I like, like having my toes in both ponds, essentially. Mm-hmm. That's great. Well, what uh, is the most important lesson you think you've learned? The most important lesson in terms of writing and publishing, I think it's just be true to yourself, be authentic, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because, you know, there's always FOMO. You know, you hear this new technique. I used to listen to a bunch more podcasts about publishing than I do, and I had to stop because I was just Mm -hmm. running myself ragged trying to do all the things. Mm -hmm. You can't do all the things. It's impossible. And so just trying to gently, you know, release the FOMO and be like, I just have to do what I'm doing, kind of eyes on your own paper. And it's so hard because mm-hmm. there's so many people doing amazing things and you're like, oh, well, I could do that too. And, you know, I want to try that. And they tell you try things, especially with indie, you won't know until you try, but you can't try everything and you will burn out very quickly if you yeah. try to keep up with everybody. So that sort of authenticity, not just in what you're writing and your voice, but in just understanding that everyone is different. And, right. you know, stay open-minded to things, but also walk your own path and, you know, maintain your energy by not doing everything that is out there to be done. Right. Right. I found that if I can look at the people who are just so super productive and so, and, and it's not hard for them, like they're, they haven't burned out because it's just not hard. That's just who they are. They, they write through crisis. They work. You know, they they yeah. just handle things so differently than me. If I can look at it as an admiration thing, like mm-hmm. that is so amazing that they can do that as opposed to, oh, I wish I could do that, that it yeah. does help with the FOMO some uh, because I've just realized I know that I, there are things I cannot write through, you know, I mean, or things I can't do, but they can. And I just find that amazing, really just amazing. Right. And if I can really keep that perspective, it does help, but hard sometimes. Yeah, we have a wealth of knowledge of possibilities of ways to do things and mm-hmm. things to try. It is hard to kind of rein ourselves in sometimes and not mm-hmm. not do the scattershot approach. Yeah. 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 And it's better when you focus on something, you know, try different things, but at least give yourself time to focus on one thing at a time, like multitasking. Mm-hmm. They've even shown that multitasking doesn't really work. Mm-hmm. And it's it just Yeah. Yeah, we were so yeah. to build goods with that, like a few years yes. ago. <laughs> that was just well, what's the biggest change you've had to make in your thinking, do you think? Um, in my thinking, I think that part of it, it's like what we were talking about is, mm-hmm. is like, I have to, at a certain point, slow down a little bit mm-hmm. and figure out what I really want to be doing. Mm-hmm. You know, like defining success is important and defining why you're here. Like, why am I still writing? Writing is pretty mm-hmm. tough, you know, mm-hmm. and we all have to have a reason to get up every day and do it. Mm-hmm. And so like, what is that thing? And yeah. and I think it's changed for me over time, but the core of it is still like, I've always been a writer. I've, I've always had stories to tell. Mm-hmm. So I always want to be doing this no matter how, regardless of how I'm published and, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's all these things I can't control, but the story, like focusing on the story, focusing on the best stories that I can and the ones that light me up inside to create, mm-hmm. um, 
I think that there was an Elizabeth Gilbert quote about creating a riot in your own heart, like focusing on things that create a riot in your heart. Mm-hmm. And that really spoke to me. It's like, that's how I can continue to do this no matter what happens externally. Right. So tr- I'm trying to focus on that sort of inner fire. That's amazing. I love that. And was that in Big Magic? I think so. Yeah. yeah I love that book. It's amazing. And it's time for me to listen to it again, because I usually do it once a year and mm-hmm. usually at the beginning of the year, because I just love it so much. Um, but yeah, I love that. So besides kind of being open-minded, a little more open-minded to traditional publishing, if you were starting over, what what would you do differently? Or you can expound on that if it, about being more open-minded if you want. I probably would still self-publish because I learned so much. I met so many people. Um, it was a good foundation to learn more. Right. What would I do differently? Uh, my first year, I was trying to do you know the faster publishing model. So I put out mm-hmm. four books that year. And then it was a while before I put out another book. <laughs> yeah. <after. laughs> So I think I would, I think it's good to follow your interests. I was doing two series mm-hmm. and going back and forth, which helped because writing epic fantasy takes a lot out of me. Mm-hmm. And then I was doing a contemporary every other book, but I would probably slow down and uh, just, you know, not try to keep up with this idea that you have to publish very, very quickly, which is not something that I personally can do and try to focus on ways you know, finding success with like a slower pace earlier on, because I did have moments of burnout in the early years where I was like, I I just don't know if I can do this. I don't have any ideas. I'm, you know, I don't know if I can meet these deadlines. And that was really tough. And, you know, I think a lot of us go through that. But if I could have given myself some wisdom back then, it would have just been like, slow down, take your time. This is, you have a long career, hopefully, Mm -hmm. and you can just pace yourself a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you still do you do multiple books a year or do you just do? I do. I can do comfortably like two, mm-hmm. maybe three if some of them are short, but we're talking like a long book. My fantasies are 120 to 150,000 words mm-hmm. and then maybe like a 70 or 80,000 word, word book as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can yeah. publish maybe 200,000 words a year, however it's split up. Yeah. And I, above that, it gets a little uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So I think a question people would have would be in between your releases, do you stay in touch with your readers? And if you do, like, how do you do that? How do you keep them engaged? Um, I think two books a year is still a lot, but mm-hmm. some people would say, oh, that's so slow. Right. So <laughs> like, how do you keep them engaged in between? Yeah, I do have a newsletter. And so when I'm not near a release, it's usually monthly. And then I increase to about every other week when I'm closer to a release. Mm-hmm. So I do that. Um, the podcast has listener, um, has readers, who listen to it as well. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, I have a lot of authors who listen to my, my podcast, my imaginary friends, but I do have a fair number of readers. And so I, I stay stay in touch with them that way. And I'm not great on social media because I do disappear for long periods of time (laughs) because I just don't, I can't manage everything. I can't do all the things I have to do and be on social media. Right. But I do try to stay up with, up to date with the newsletter and, and give them a nice chunk of what I've been up to, what I'm working on, you know, the book that might not come out till next year, but here's some ideas and here's what I've been struggling with, or here's some, you know, quick wins that I've had to keep them invested. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that'd be interesting for, for our listeners who don't publish quite so fast because Mm -hmm. I do hear that question a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that two books a year is still a lot of work and it's a lot to keep up with. So yeah, it takes all the time that I have. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, what about world building? Um, Tell us um, like how you, how you do it. And if you have any tips for someone who's writing in these types of genres where, I mean, even, even romance and cozy mystery, they are there is world building going on, but I don't think it's to the extent that mm-hmm. like sci-fi and fantasy authors do. Right. So give us some some of your insight on that. Yeah, I always start world building. And world building for me is connected to plot and character. So I can't I don't really separate them. And when mm-hmm. I teach world building, I try to teach it connected. It's like your world and your character, your plot, and even your theme should mm-hmm. should go together. And so I think about conflict. You know, mm-hmm. it depends on how the story comes to me initially, but whether the story comes as a character who has a problem or a situation like a premise, mm-hmm. how does the world that they're in create more conflict? Mm-hmm. So like with my very first book, a character came to me at first, but she was in conflict with her environment. She was isolated. She was alone. 
And I was like, well, why is that? There's a war going on. What was happening? It's a, it's really about asking questions and diving deeper. World building mm-hmm. is just asking, why does that happen? Getting into the motivations of the thing. So whether it's magic, well, where did the magic come from? What does it do? Why does it do that? How do the people who have magic not take over the world? Maybe they do take over the world. Um, and just being really curious and asking lots of questions and I don't like to have, you know, these million page checklists that exist for world building. It's like world build in the next six months. I'm like, no, I need to finish the book in six months. I don't yeah. have to, just to build the world. We don't have time for that, right? <laughs> but some people approach it like that, which, you know, if that works for yeah. them, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But it's like, okay, what do I need to know in order to get my character together, what, to get my character arc? What does, what do I need to know about the world, the backstory, so that it affects the character, that it motivates her to do this thing that she wants to do? And then all the obstacles that she's hitting on the plot or the things that the antagonist might be throwing in her way, how does the world exacerbate those things? How does the world throw up more obstacles? So yeah, it's it's really trying to, every step of the way, I kind of go round robin. It's like, okay, I, I learn more about the character and that causes questions about the world. And then I can answer those and they have questions about the plot and just go back and forth through them all so that they're building together. Mm-hmm. So would you say the worlds you create are kind of characters within the book? I mean, mm-hmm. they they because they affect right. your main character so much. I do. I try to make the world uh, a character. And even like uh, my latest traditionally published book takes place in Washington, D.C. So it's a historical fantasy in a real place. But mm-hmm. the world is still, I, I still wanted the world to feel like a character. So mm-hmm. in that case, it wasn't me creating from scratch. Right. It was me rebuilding this real place and making it feel real to the reader. So mm-hmm. they feel like they're walking down those streets and they understand what this city is and that mm-hmm the the time period and the and the location affects the characters in certain ways. So you can absolutely do it with real places. It doesn't have to be, you know, Middle Earth or something like that. Right. right. Yeah. Well building magic to... always seems a little overwhelming. But yeah. um but I guess if you do it that way, like by asking questions and how does it affect my character mm-hmm. and how does it move my character along in her journey. Right. Or what how does it block my character then that does would I guess simplify it in that uh, my concern would be it'd be so big like the, it yeah. would just be unwieldy and out of hand but if you keep it kind of contained mm-hmm. to your story and your characters then that might be a little it bit makes easier. it a lot easier like the, when I was writing Earth Singer Chronicles which was my first series which is epic fantasy mm-hmm. there's so many decisions that are so overwhelming mm-hmm. and when I got to the second book I'm like I don't know how I can make all these decisions sometimes you just feel like you're pulling things out of thin air right. and I don't want to do that right. so if yeah if I kind of build these boxes build these boundaries around what I'm doing and mm-hmm. so everything is connected right. it cuts down the decisions that you have to make so it's less overwhelming and right. also everything feels connected and integrated and right. the reader feels more immersed in the world okay mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really what I like point. about writing a series is like, once you get going, you've kind of got some of those parameters and it's yeah. not quite, there's not so much decision fatigue, but there's still some, but right. Yeah. yeah. So when you are planning a book, do you spend a certain amount of time just like figuring all this stuff out? Or do you write as you go and figure it out as you go? What kind of writer are you? So I call myself a plotter, although I think I'm sort of in the middle. Mm-hmm. I do plot ahead of time and I spend anywhere from a few weeks to a month or two, depending on the length of the book or how difficult it is <laughs> to conceive of. And that's coming up with, you know, the outline. I like to have a synopsis before I start writing. I do some character work and I do the basics of the world building. And then I do fast drafting. So my first draft, as fast as possible, no editing. And that teaches me a lot of the the things that I don't know. And I'm Uh still asking questions. So there's a lot of gaps in my first draft. It's still like Mm -hmm. people don't have names and, you know, magic system may not have all the rules yet. Mm -hmm. But by the time I get to the end, I can do another round of planning and say, okay, what do I have? What did I learn when I was writing? And then build everything, sort of answer, you know, you find a lot of those uh, answers to those questions as you're writing, because through like just intuitiveness, you know, it just Mm -hmm. comes to you. And so it's like a mix of careful plotting ahead of time and also veering away from the plot when you need to and discovery writing and Mm -hmm. then sort of planning on the, on the back end too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably freeing for a lot of people because I think for like, to me, I, I, and, and fantasy books in general, but 
it seems so big, again, so big, so overwhelming, <laughs> that if you have that permission to do that, like, learn as you go and then fix it in the, in the, mm -hmm. uh, revisions, then that, that, that seems more doable. I think that that seems more, uh, manageable. I yeah. Think. It's, yeah. I found that it's that just through trial and error and just through like losing my way through a few books. Yeah. Well, there's be a better way to do this. <laughs> I'm not creating anything magical uh, or anything like that. And I've lost my way more than once. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have signed paperbacks. Uh, you sell them on your website. How how do you do that? How's that set up? Can you share that with with our listeners? Sure. Yeah, selling direct is is huge now. Mm -hmm. um, I've been I use PayHip, and mm -hmm. so you know, in my other life, I'm a website developer. So right. I, I I build Shopify stores for clients. I build WooCommerce stores, but for my own, you know, the cobblers. <laughs> child has no shoes but also <laughs> most like half of my books are traditional and so I I didn't feel like building an, a huge store for my indie books mm -hmm. and pay up is great I think pay up is a great place to start especially if you um if you have a few books if you're hybrid if you just don't want the intensity of Shopify or something like that mm -hmm. it does the job really well and it's really easy to set up and so I kind of hide it so it's integrated into my website which you can do. So you don't have to leave to go to Shopify. There's a way that, I mean, mm -hmm. to go to PayHip, there's mm -hmm. a way that you can kind of check out. I have a WordPress site um, mm -hmm. and it's not that difficult to set up. But um, yeah, for other, you know, I, I I built Shopify sites, which are great. It's just a whole nother level of complexity that you have to be ready to deal with if you mm -hmm. want to go that route. Right. So you're fulfilling the orders yourself, like for the site you you have, do you keep stock in, of your yeah. books? Yeah. I do. I, I wanted to sell signed books as opposed to just, you know, ship mm -hmm. having print on demand for my site, which I might do in the future, but I think there's a value for my readers and having them signed. Mm -hmm. So I keep I keep a stock on hand. Um and even my traditionally published books, I can buy them at a discount and offer them and sell them too. And it's not I don't I don't have that many. I don't have like a whole room full of books. Right. But you know, I'll get like twenty five at a time and, mm -hmm. and put them in the closet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's great. That's a good way to start in direct sales to kind of try things out, see how it works. It's not like you're dedicating like a month or whatever to getting a store set up. Exactly. You can, you can do it kind really of ease quickly. in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so I was making this list of questions. We were looking over it and I was like, okay, you're writing, you're doing two podcasts <laughs> and I don't know what all else, signing books in your spare time. So like, how do you do all this? How do you manage all these things? I have a good planner. <laughs> I took Sarah Cannon's HB90 a few years ago, there you um, go. which is yeah. super helpful, uh -huh. and then melded it into my system. Um, but yeah, it's every week I sit down, usually Monday mornings, and I plan mm -hmm. my week. And I like time boxing. I mm -hmm. found that's really helpful for me. I don't ever stick to it. Mm -hmm. So that's not even, it's not necessary. <laughs> Just the act of doing it makes me feel better. It makes me feel a little bit more organized. So tell everybody what that is. Yeah. So time boxing <laughs> is when you take your day, you take your schedule and you block out time for certain tasks. Mm -hmm. So since I, I still run a website development business, uh, and so usually I write in the mornings. So I'll say, you know, eight to 11, I'm writing, you know, 11 to 12, I'll just do email. I'll try to get through at least an hour of email. It's probably not going to be <laughs> long enough. <laughs> um, you know, block off lunch, any meetings, block off deep work time. So mm -hmm. for if I'm doing some marketing stuff or web stuff, I have different I block off my different businesses, which is how I manage to do it. So if, if I know I need at least four hours to, you know, get good headway in building a client website, and then I need at least two hours to figure out something I'm doing for my sub stack or the course that I'm building or something like that. And just literally putting it on the calendar, blocking off your time, making appointments with yourself for your different tasks. Mm -hmm. And that really helps you get them done. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's great. Yeah. Well, you can't dangle the course you're building like in front of us without telling us what it is. <laughs> I do. I have a course called Imaginary World Building, Creating uh -huh. Fictional Worlds for Writers. Uh -huh. And it's it's available now. It's, it's self-paced. Oh, good. Um, and so, yeah, I'm also doing a, a workshop, some additional workshops, like I'm doing a revision workshop that should be out soon. Uh, and yeah, I, I like to like, share world building stuff and talk to people about world building. So my course is like conceptual. It's one of those things where I'm not going to take you through like a 10,000, you know, checklist of every, like, how do you name your rivers and things like that? Like that can be valuable, but <laughs> it's more, how do you integrate 
the world, like we've been talking about, world, character, and plot in a way that's manageable, that's not overwhelming, and that can deepen the experience for your readers. Mm -hmm. Is that available on your website? Like, can yeah, yeah. um, my website or myimaginaryfriends.net is part of my podcast and my courses website, and I also have a weekly newsletter for writers that comes out every every Monday uh, that's available there too. Okay, well, we'll have that link in the show notes. Do you incorporate maps into your like fantasy world? And do you do the maps afterwards or before or while you're doing it? Maps are during, maps are during the writing process. Mm -hmm. So I've had uh, maps in a couple of the books Mm -hmm. and I'll do a sketch myself. Mm -hmm. Recently, the book that's coming out next June, it's a a small town. So I invented a town and I had to make a map of this town because like I wanted the town to feel like a character. And so I, I drew that online and then I usually give it to a professional to, if I'm going to have, you know, the map in the yeah, book, in the, book the very book. first version I did, of Song of Blood and Stone, the map that's in the hardcover version I is the one I did in, in Photoshop. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, I'm not happy with this map. My publisher was like, oh, it's fine. I'm like, no, I'm hiring him. I'm hiring him out because <laughs> <laughs> I want it to look better. But yeah, yeah. yeah. It happens during the, the writing process. Good. All right. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. That is so cool. Um, well, Tell us, this has been awesome. Um, I've learned a lot, um, made some notes myself. Um, but tell us what you think you've done, the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success. Having a good community. Um, mm-hmm. I started a mastermind, a weekly mastermind with some other authors eight or nine years ago, and we're still going strong. Oh, wow. Um, I discovered, you know, back when I first won won NaNoWriMo with a group of people who met online that, oh, this is a way that I can actually get things done. Mm -hmm. So creating some kind of community or joining a community that exists, but if it doesn't exist in the way that you want it, creating it, that really has made a huge difference, whether it's just accountability for writing, Mm -hmm. having someone to bounce business ideas off of. Um, you know, critique partners, right. it, it might be different people or they might be the same people, but that, mm-hmm. yeah, I couldn't have done what I've done without my people, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I it's think that's true. a wonderful yes. answer. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. Well, where can where can people find out more about you? We've mentioned a few links, but where should people go? Where's the easiest place for them to go to find out about your yeah. books? My author website has everything and that's lpenelope.com. Okay, perfect. All right, well, we will have a link to that in the course in the show notes. And just thank you for being here and sharing your information with us. I think it'll be super helpful. And um, thanks to Alexa Larberg for editing and producing the podcast and Adriel Wiggins for doing the admin. And if y'all want to support the podcast, you can find the link at wishidknownforwriters.com slash support. And the show notes will be at that link without support. All right, we'll see y'all next week. All right, bye. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.